Well, hello everyone. My name is Ben Dore. I'm the Head of Publishing Operations at the MJA. Um, I'd like to welcome you tonight to our MJA webinar, Supported Medical Education as it is by Glaxo Smith Klein PLC, with the MJA's usual editorial independence. To get us started, I'd like to acknowledge the Gadigal people of the Eora Nation, the traditional custodians of this land, and pay my respects to the elders both past, present and emerging. I'll now hand over to our Chair, Professor Bill Rawlinson from the University of New South Wales. Thanks, Ben. Uh, look, it's a great pleasure to welcome you tonight uh, to this update on shingles and particularly on vaccines. We have three fantastic speakers. Um, we have uh, Tony Cunningham, um, who's known internationally for his research on the immunology of HIV and herpes viruses, and particularly on vaccine development. And he's one of the two top-sided herpes vaccinologists internationally. Uh, we've got Sanjay Jaya Singh, who's a medical epidemiologist and particularly is, uh, works in evidence-based immunisation policy and provides recommendations to ATAGI, the uh, Australian Technical Advisory Group on Immunology. And we also are fortunate to have Dr Nikki Gilroy, who's a past member of um, ATAGI, as well as former chair of the Advisory Committee for the Safety of Vaccine. So three fantastic speakers. Uh, just briefly, I'm going to introduce the subject. Uh, next. We're really focusing a lot on new vaccines and, and the dreadful problems that can arise from shingles, particularly in immunocompromised patients, as is shown on the left, um, where dissemination occurs and, of course, it uh, can and, and is often fatal. Uh, these are my declarations. Next. I'm not going to talk much except to say that um, shingles, that is uh, herpes zoster, is an um, an extremely important problem, particularly in immune compromised individuals. And we're not going to talk about COVID tonight. There may be some questions, but I thought uh, we'd just put this slide up at the start to remind everybody that there are a lot of immune compromised conditions, but there's also a lot of inflammatory conditions. And for example, with COVID-19, we have seen higher rates of uh, uh, zoster and of uh, herpes virus reactivation associated sometimes with um, prolonged um, shedding and also with uh, more severe disease. So we've certainly not heard the last of uh, problems with shingles at all. So look, uh, I'd like to um, thank everybody for coming tonight. I'd like to thank the MJ for um, putting this on and the speakers and we'll go to our first speaker, uh, Dr Sanjay Jai Singh. Thanks Sanjay. Oh, thanks very much Bill. Um, uh, so what I will do is I will just go through uh, some of the uh, epidemiology of, of uh, herpes zoster uh, with uh, some estimates uh, of herpes zoster uh, relevant to our population and also uh, provide uh, a bit of an introduction uh, to uh, the, the vaccines uh, that are available against shingles and, and also talk a bit about the, the, the vaccination program, uh, particularly the uh, NIP funded uh, vaccination program that we have in place here. Uh, next slide, please. Uh, so, uh, how common is herpes zoster in, in, in our country? Uh, about 140,000 cases occur annually, um, uh, uh, causing about uh, two, two and a half thousand hospitalizations and about 30, de uh, 30 deaths uh, each year. Uh, there is that graph on the left uh, hand side on the slide, uh, which, uh, which shows age-specific incidence rates uh, per thousand population uh, from 2002 to 2012. Um, uh, thing to note there is that the herpes zoster incidence is uh, is uh, particularly high in in uh, older uh, uh, individuals. Um, and uh, the the diagram on the on the uh, left uh, of the screen uh, or right side right of the screen uh, shows uh, the burden of herpes zoster in in Australia. So this is using as the measure. Uh, disability adjusted uh, life years lost. Uh, so this got herpes zoster uh, compared to few other vaccine preventable diseases. Uh, the thing to note is so the, the size of that bubble uh, shows uh, the, the impact, the population impact of those diseases and uh, shingles there uh, is, uh, is uh, in terms of the impact uh, less uh, than than some of the other uh, vaccine preventable diseases like pneumococcal disease and 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 influenza but still uh, causes a, a fair a bit of uh, uh, in popula population level impact next slide please uh, so this uh, slide shows that 
uh, as I said before, herpesost uh, incidence increases with age, uh, so it, that uh, increase uh, rises uh, particularly steeply from uh, 50 uh, years uh, onwards. Um, uh, so this uh, shows, uh, again, age-specific incidence rates of herpesost uh, from a number of uh, OECD countries, uh, including our country. Uh, uh, in terms of uh, incidence rates uh, in those under 50 years of age, you have a rate of about uh, around four per thousand uh, compared to about uh, you know, 14 to 16 uh, per thousand in uh, 7 to 8 year olds. Um, one, one thing to note uh, here uh, also is that uh, complications of herpes zoster, uh, of which most common uh, most common is uh, post herpetic neuralgia, uh, which is defined as a neuropathic pain uh, that lasts uh, more than 90 days uh, following the onset of uh, shing uh, shingles rash, uh, is is also more common in in uh, those who are older, uh, with uh, uh, the risk being uh, one to ten in uh, 50 to 59 year olds, increasing to uh, one in four in uh, eight and above. Uh, next slide, please. Uh, so, who, who are the people who are at, at uh, particular risk of uh, uh, herpes zoster? Uh, apart from uh, elderly individuals, uh, those uh, people with immunocompromising conditions are particularly at high risk of uh, herpes zoster. Um, there is a list of those conditions there, and then uh, there are corresponding incidence rates. Uh, the thing to note here is that uh, those um, rates are particularly uh, high in, in conditions like uh, hemo hemopathic uh, stem cell transplant. Um, they have uh, uh, um, uh, herpes zoster incidence uh, that is uh, you know, several fold higher than what, uh, what is in the general population. And uh, all those uh, conditions listed there have uh, you know, high risk of herpes zoster. And uh, also I uh, need to mention here that uh, complications of herpes zoster, including uh, post neuralgia, is also more common in these uh, individuals. And they, uh, the, those complications tend to last longer uh, in, in those people with those compl complications. Next slide, please. Um, uh, uh, in terms of uh, the, the uh, Zoster vaccination program, uh, we do have a funded vaccination program uh, for herpes Zoster uh, as part of the National Immunization Program. The vaccine offered uh, free of charge here is the is Zostavax, the live attenuated uh, shingles vaccine. Uh, this essentially is a concentrated uh, chickenpox vaccine, um, and it is uh, it is. Uh, uh, offered free of charge to those uh, those turning 70 years of age. And there is also a, a time limited uh, CATA program for 71 to 79 year olds in its, uh, its um, uh, scheduled to end uh, in, in October 2023. And one thing, uh, very important to note here is that the, the what I've got in red font there is that uh, this uh, live uh, 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 herpes zoster vaccine, uh, Zostavax, is contraindicated in, in those who are immunocompromised and those are the people who really need, that they have the greatest need for protection against uh, herpes zoster, as I showed before. Uh, quickly looking at uh, some of the vaccine characteristics of Zostavax. So this is data from some of the pivotal trials uh, of uh, Zostavax. Uh, sorry, that's the next slide. Uh, have we got that slide on? Which shows the vaccine efficacy estimates, yep. Uh, so, um, so this shows uh, the efficacy estimates, as I said, from the pivotal trials. Uh, the thing uh, to note here is that uh, the vaccine efficacy of uh, Zostavax uh, declines uh, with uh, with age, uh, age of vaccination. So, in 50 to 59 year olds, is um, uh, is uh, about 70 percent, and it uh, goes down to about 64 percent in 60 to 69 year olds, and uh, 70 and above, it's about 38 percent. Um, and uh, I've also shown here the vaccine efficacy uh, estimates for uh, post hepatic neuralgia. The decline with age is not reflected in post hepatic neuralgia effectiveness uh, efficacy here, uh, which which means that um, uh, even if you get breakthrough cases of uh, herpes zoster after being vaccinated, your likelihood of developing post hepatic neuralgia would be less than uh, someone who has not been vaccinated with Zostavax. Next slide, please. And the other important thing to note about Zostavax is that it 
the uh, the vaccine uh, protective uh, effect uh, declines with time uh, since vaccination. Uh, this data is from um, uh, the US uh, using uh, health fund data uh, that shows uh, clearly uh, how there is a loss of uh, a protective effect uh, uh, with, uh, time, with the time since vaccination. So out to about 78 uh, seven to eight years, uh, it sort of uh, uh, more than halves from what it uh, initially was. So this is showing a vaccine effectiveness in uh, so 50 and above. Uh, and if uh, we look at uh, those uh, changes uh, with time of effectiveness in uh, those who are older than that, because uh, the starting point would be lower, uh, they tend to um, be uh, almost uh, no no uh, protective effect uh, out to about uh, went out to about 780. Next slide, please. Uh, what has been the uptake of the Zostavax in the program here in Australia? Uh, so these are, uh, this shows data uh, from uh, the doses reported to the Australian Immunization Register. So from the uh, vaccine coverage reports that the National Center of Immunization and Surveillance NCIR uh, publishes, about 30% uh, uptake uh, based on AIR data. But uh, this is likely to be uh, an underestimate because uh, um, at this uh, time, so this is uh, 2019 and 2020 data, uh, the, the reporting of uh, vaccinations to AI was not, not mandatory, uh, so uh, likely uh, under-reporting. Uh, but when you take into consideration uh, the vaccine doses distributed as well, the the uh, the estimate is is about uh, sixty percent, which is likely to be uh, more more reliable. Um, next slide, please. Uh, so, has the has this vaccination program uh, led to any decreases in in disease? Um, yes, it has. So, this is uh, data from. Uh, uh, GP encounters that had a diagnosis of herpes zoster. Uh, three panels, uh, the one in uh, the middle panel shows uh, for the uh, age uh, uh, group eligible for receiving Zostavax uh, on the program. Uh, there is a clear decline. The dotted lines uh, show uh, when the vaccine was introduced. Uh, the decline is estimated to be from 10 to 6 per thousand uh, uh, persons and and uh, this is uh, during the first two years of the uh, Zostavax program, and it is estimated that uh, this translates into about 7,000 cases of Zostavax uh, averted, uh, 7,000 cases of herpes zoster averted uh, uh, from the Zostavax program. Next slide, please. Uh, so since uh, July 2021, we have another vaccine now available uh, uh, for herpes zoster uh, called Shingrix. Uh, importantly, this is a non-live vaccine, a recombinant subunit vaccine. Um, uh, compared to the single dose course of uh, Zostavax, this is a two dose course. Uh, and initially it was also registered for 50 and, 50 and above, but uh, because it is, it is uh, uh, not a live vaccine, it can be uh, safely given to immunocompromised people. But one thing very important to note is that it is not currently funded on the immunization program. Uh, so patients will have to pay for that vaccine if they are to receive that vaccine. Uh, next slide, please. To, uh, thing to note here is that uh, since uh, December 2021, uh, the uh, age group for which uh, Shingrix is indicated has been uh, broadened uh, to uh, include those 18 and above who are immunocompromised. So next slide, please. Uh, where do you find uh, recommendations for herpes zoster vaccines? Uh, the Australian Technical Advisory Group on Immunization uh, uh, recommendations for uh, herpes zoster vaccines, including Zostavax and Shingrix, is found in uh, this uh, uh, target statement, which is publicly available. Uh, I'll put the link there. Uh, and and uh, uh, the most up-to-date uh, recommendations for both vaccines are available uh, on that uh, ATAGI statement. Uh, usually, uh, all ATAGI uh, best practice clinical recommendations are uh, 
published in the Australian Ministry Handbook, uh, the digital version, which is now available. Uh, but uh, if you if you look at uh, Shingrix uh, recommendations, for uh, Shingrix recommendations, they are not incorporated yet in the Australian Ministry Handbook. It is uh, yeah, that is currently underway. So for the for 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 the moment, you will have to look at the Otagi statement if you are to. Uh, and know what the uh, recommendations are for Shingrix uh, in Australia. So I will stop there and hand over to Nikki. Thanks very much. Thank you. Um, look, I'm going to really talk about some of the clinical scenarios um, where we really need to think about herpes zoster and uh, vaccination. So if we could please go to the next slide. So how do the manifestations of herpes zoster differ between immunocompromised and immunocompetent patients? Well, first and foremost, complications, particularly with the acute episode, are often very much more severe in those who are immunocompromised with severe pain and often a much more protracted period of healing. Um, and beyond the acute episode, a higher incidence of prolonged pain and post herpetic neuralgia is seen far more in the immunocompromised. Uh, we do know that in the immun immunocompromised, there's a greater propensity for herpes zoster to involve more dermatomes, multiple dermatomes, uh, that the cutaneous manifestations of this disease can be very severe and involve multiple layers of the skin, causing necrosis. And also we know that this uh, virus as well, when it reactivates and you know, compromised, uh, can often cause um, disseminated disease with visceral dissemination involving critical organs such as brain encephalitis, uh, hepatitis uh, involving obviously the liver and uh, pneumonitis uh, of the, uh, in, in those with severe immunocompromise. Next slide, please. So in terms of pain, we know that those th who have zoster both during their acute episode and after uh, who are older often tend to have um, pain which will be of a higher, a higher rate than uh, as if they're older. Um, Next slide, please. Um, it's important to also draw out that not only is age a risk for um, post-herpetic post pain and post-herpetic neuralgia, but also immunocompromise. And this is seen very clearly in those who have been the recipients of um, hemopoietic stem cell transplants. Next slide, please. So in terms of zoster and its severe manifestations in the immunocompromise, this is quite nicely illustrated uh, with this picture of a patient with uh, a case report of a patient with chronic myeloid leukemia who as you can see has uh, very severe skin manifestations with uh, skin necrosis and, um, and, and obviously quite widespread uh, dermatomal involvement. Next slide please. So what are the grades of immunocompromise and how do they affect firstly the manifestations of herpes zoster and the immunisation against it. So we can think about stratifying immunocompromised risk into three uh, broad categories, mild, moderate and severe. And it's really in the severe category that there is a risk of herpes um, zoster being mar markedly increased. But importantly, in those with severe and moderate degrees of immunocompromise, uh, you know, paradoxically, as Sanjay had explained, the very, the very population that would get benefit from vaccination are actually contraindicated to receive the live attenuated vaccine, Zostavax. Uh, next slide, please. So what are the diseases which induce severe uh, immunocompromise? So there's really a hierarchy here, but clearly uh, patients with hematological malignancies and bearing in mind, many of these diseases are associated with quite profound immunity. Uh, certain haematological conditions, lymphomas, um, the chronic lymphocytic leukemic patients, but also patients with myeloma who get proteose, proteasome inhibitors such as bortezomib um, are also very much at increased risk of, of herpes zoster. For patients who are the recipients of autologous or allogeneic transplant, they too are very much at risk. And bearing in mind the indications for transplant in and, of the, in and of their own right are also associated with an elevated risk. So these are patients who often go to transplant with pre-existing problems such as uh, lymphomas, myeloma, 
uh, or acute leukemia. Uh, patients with solid tumours who receive chemotherapy or radiotherapy are also uh, increased can uh, be severely immunocompromised and therefore at increased risk. And patients who are the recipients of solid organ transplants and in fact to heart, lung, liver and kidney. Um, and in terms of HIV, obviously there's a spectrum of uh, disease here, but patients with AIDS or who have profound CD4 lymphopenia, usually a threshold of less than 200, uh, this confers a much greater risk of uh, herpes zoster. Next slide, please. So Sandra has actually spoken to this, uh, this table where really we have a hierarchy of risk. Uh, with herpes zoster, hemopoietic stem cell transplants really uh, present the highest risk population for herpes zoster. And if you think about this, many of these populations would be the very populations for whom we would recommend antiviral prophylaxis because of this elevated risk. And uh, if we could just go to the next slide, please. So in terms of, uh, apart from high risk severe immunocompromising conditions, there's also a whole raft of the population who may be also um, not only at, at risk of severe complications from herpes zoster, but more so the issues around live attenuation use in this po these populations, including individuals who might be 70 or older who would otherwise be age appropriate. But if they're on drugs that suppress their immune system, that then becomes a contraindication to the use of live attenuated vaccine. So some examples of this include uh, particularly corticosteroids, which are used across a range of conditions. Um, but the, really the threshold where a live attenuated vaccine would be contraindicated are really those who are receiving 20 milligrams or more of prednisone a day. We also have um, many patients who are on disease modifying anti-rheumatic drugs. Um, conventional DMARDs include drugs such as azathioprine, 6 mecaptopurine and methotrexate. These are widely used in a population and generally uh, a strict contraindication to the use of Sostavax is often dose dependent for these three drugs. However, if any of these drugs, regardless of what dose is being used, are being used in combination with steroids, this becomes really an absolute contraindication to Sostavax use. Mycophenolate, uh, regardless of what it's being used to work with is also contraindicated. Uh, Zostavax is contraindicated in patients on mycophenolate. Um, really the only drugs that can probably be used um, safely um, on their own uh, for which Zostavax could be um, administered um, are sulfasalazine and hydroxychloroquine. But if they're used with steroids, that's a different story. Calcineurin inhibitors similarly widely used of conditions. Um, again, any dose of these drugs would be a contraindication to live attenuated vaccine use. And then of course biologics now being used in a range of practices, dermatolo dermatological practice, uh, inflammatory bowel disease, uh, rheumatological conditions, autoimmune conditions, any dose of these, uh, any patient who has had a dose of these drugs administered would be contraindicated for Zostavax. However, on the right hand side of this table, there are ways people have tried to work around Zostavax in terms of these populations. So one suggestion has been that if you anticipate your patient is going to need immunosuppression, then you may think in advance of giving Zostavax. And usually that would be in the month before you plan to give these drugs. Um, however, in the case of steroids, you may be able to give Zostavax once the steroid dose has been discontinued. But for these other drugs, there usually has to be a fairly decent interval be before you would consider it. And really the longest interval pertains to patients who get any of the biologic therapies. Uh, you really would need at least a 12 month interval after coming off these drugs to be considered for Zostavax. So I will uh, finish my presentation there and now hand over to Professor Cunningham. Thank you. Thanks very much, uh, Nikki. My uh, declarations are uh, listed here. Next slide, please. I'm going to go on to the next slide, so I'll come back to that later on. So uh, this is um, the recombinant zoster vaccine. It consists of a single protein, which is produced by recombinant uh, uh, technology called glycoprotein E. And this is a, an antigen which induces uh, both antibody and T cells. and uh, T cells are of critical importance in the uh, 
control of zoster, more important than antibody. In fact, T cells drop off in, uh, uh, in people over the age of 50, particularly uh, against uh, zoster. Now, if you use a single protein, uh, then you deprive the vaccine of uh, immunostimulatory um, nucleic acids and lipids. So these have to be replaced by what are called adjuvants or immunostimulants. And in uh, the recombinant zoster vaccine, there are two of them, one from the bacterial cell wall called MPL, another one called uh, QS21 from a South American tree. And the two of them synergize together to provide uh, intense immunostimulation at the time that the antigen is administered. Next slide, please. So you can see on the left-hand panel that when the vaccine is uh, inoculated into muscle uh, in uh, mouse models within 30 minutes and also primates, uh, the vaccine, both components, the antigen and the adjuvants, flow into the lymph node and induce a, a cascade of immune responses, starting with uptake by uh, the, exter the macrophages at the periphery of the uh, lymph node and ultimately stimulating both B and T cells to produce antibody circulating against um, uh, varicella zoster virus and T cells. And you can see that on the right, this induces in the orange graph as opposed to blue, a much higher peak, broader immune response, which also lasts for longer. Next slide. And on the right-hand side in the green columns uh, is what happens if you simply give glycoprotein E by itself. and uh, we've got a stepwise effect of age. So in people over the age of 70, the rightmost column, only 10% of people will develop an adequate uh, T cell response. And then in people age 60 to 70, it's about 30% and it gets up above 80 for 50 to 59. But if you mix the adjuvants in, in the orange bars on the left-hand side, all age groups show uh, in 90 percent of subjects an adequate uh, immune response. So this adjuvant is absolutely critical for the uh, uh, extremely good immune response. Is that translated into efficacy? Let's look at the next slide. So in this slide, uh, the two trials which we conducted, uh, the first trial people over the age of 50, and the second trial was run concurrently to try and increase the admixture of people over the age of 70, those that Sanjay mentioned are most at risk of post-hepatic neuralgia, which is the most feared complication of herpes zoster. And we were stunned at a, uh, a conference in uh, Paris uh, when these results were announced uh, that the uh, Efficacy was 97% in people over the age of 50, 91% in those over the age of 70, and the bars make these uh, indistinguishable. So very high efficacy uh, in people even over the age of 80. This is the, up until the RNA vaccines, this is the highest performing vaccine we've ever seen in the aging. Next slide. And this efficacy was carried across against post-hepatic neuralgia so that uh, most of the effect on post-hepatic neuralgia is in the prevention of herpes zoster, although we've subsequently published that there is also an improvement uh, in pain with people who have breakthrough zoster as well. Um, on the right-hand side, you can see similar vaccine efficacy against other complications, important ones like ocular zoster, ophthalmic zoster, which can cause uh, blindness. Next slide. And uh, most recently, last year, we published the data in terms of follow-up. There's a little break there. You'll see the blue arrow is the first trials up to about four years. 
and then a little break from five to seven years as shown in the orange arrow and then the total is shown in grey and you can see 84 percent efficacy from years five to seven and overall uh, from uh, one month after the second dose to seven years 91 percent efficacy the 10-year results are about to uh, be announced and i'm sworn to secrecy for at least another few weeks uh, but uh, I'm sure you'll find those uh, very interesting. Next slide. Now, what are the other recent advances in data regarding recombinant Zoster vaccine in both immunocompetent and immunocompromised, immunocompromised patients? The high vaccine efficacy is unaffected by the presence of multiple comorbidities or of frailty, unlike influenza and pneumococcal vaccines, which drop off in the frail. Frail people uh, can be precipitated in terms of uh, admission to aged care facilities, so protecting them against Zoster is critical to avoid this. Now, I'm often asked about the efficacy of a single dose of the Zoster vaccine because in the USA they had some troubles initially with uh, roll out of the vaccine and so they had to stretch vaccine doses out and sometimes people only have single dose. We don't know from the trials but we do know from effectiveness studies that a single dose is at least 15 percent less effective than the standard double dose. So give the double dose two to six months after the first. I'm also asked that uh, if uh, the uh, reactogenicity, the side effects of this vaccine, which I'll cover in a moment and are um, quite substantial like the COVID RNA vaccines, uh, does this, uh, uh, these side effects predict the immunogenicity of the vaccine? And we published again last year that there's only a weak association between the two, which suggests that in the future we might be able to improve this vaccine reduce the side effects and retain the immunogenicity of the vaccine. Next slide. This uh, 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 builds on what Sanjay and Nikki have told you about, showing the five causes of severe immune compromise. And these are the only immune compromised patients in which uh, the recombinant Zoster vaccine has been run in terms of trials. And you can see that in three of them, they are phase three trials aimed at uh, looking at efficacy and in the other two, HIV and solid tumors, uh, we're only looking at immunogenicity and safety. So we've seen phase three trials for stem cell transplants, for hematologic malignancies, uh, receiving immunosuppressive chemotherapy and for solid tumors receiving immunosuppressive chemotherapy. Three doses were given to the HIV patients, two doses to the rest. You really only need two doses for the HIV patients, as I'll show you. Next slide. So this shows the results of those trials. So hematologic malignancy, if we go to the third column, the efficacy was 87% against herpes zoster, which is a real boon to the haematologists uh, around Australia, including my wife. Uh, so very keen to have uh, recombinant zoster vaccine. Reflects the uh, immunogenicity and 84% uh, induction of adequate CD4 T cell counts. And then when we look at uh, stem cell transplantation, dropped a bit to 68% against herpes zoster, but against post neuralgia, 89%. And this again is reflective of that high T cell immunogenicity. With solid tumors receiving chemotherapy, there was a drop in immunogenicity to 46%. Part of this is due to administering the vaccine during chemotherapy, if possible, uh, the vaccine needs to be given before or after, and I'll come back to that in a minute. Solid organ transplantation, um, we've seen some recent figures that are not really peer-reviewed, but they 
looked to be about 68%, again, correlating with immunogenicity. And HIV, particularly in HIV patients on antiretroviral therapy, the immunogenicity is very high. And so it's unlikely there's going to be a problem giving recombinant zoster vaccine to those people. Next slide. So this is what I was talking about just a moment ago. And that is, uh, if possible, as in the trial, um, do not give uh, recombinant zoster vaccine during chemotherapy. A 10-day window was used and also one after chemotherapy as well. And again, the efficacy was 87%. Next slide. When we look at um, stem cell transplantation, uh, the uh, Recombinant zoster vaccine was not given until 50 to 70 days after stem cell transplantation, and we got 68% uh, efficacy as shown in the left-hand uh, columns, 89% uh, against post neuralgia, 85% against uh, uh, hospitalization. And this in indicates how important it is to continue antiviral prophylaxis up until a month after the second dose. This is not mentioned in the ATAGI guidelines. It is mentioned in the US CDC guidelines. And it's an important point uh, practically for uh, hematologists. Next slide. Um, however, in these immune compromised people, the uh, reactogenicity or adverse side effects were higher, the local ones, were up around 80%, mainly pain, as shown in the blue bars, up above about 60% for immune competent people, compared to the black columns, which are placebo. The hatched uh, columns show grade three or severe uh, local reactions, and they occur in about uh, 10 to 15%, a bit more than the immunocompetent patients, but they only last two to three days on average. So uh, in essence, it's really important uh, to counsel people that they may get the severe side effects that uh, of pain, redness, and swelling that limit their daily activity. Next slide. And uh, the same is true even more so with systemic side effects of uh, fatigue, myalgia, uh, and fever. Uh, in the blue columns, they were increased above levels of about 40% for immunocompetence for each of these immune compromised groups. But notice one of the reasons for this is that even in the placebo recipients, they also had high levels of uh, systemic side effects, uh, an indication of the underlying disease. Next uh, slide, please. So, Recommendations in the severe immune compromised people, recombinant zoster vaccine is, uh, is best. Uh, I'm often consulted by hematologists and oncologists, and it's really only um, convenient for them to give recombinant zoster vaccine, and it's the only vaccine available in 18 to 50 year olds. Next slide. In moderate immune compromise, again, uh, recombinant zoster vaccine. There are no trial evidence yet, but there is effectiveness data showing it's pretty safe. Uh, and one um, uh, immunogenicity study showing about 75% of people developing antibodies. Um, you can, in mild immune compromise, use either uh, the recombinant zoster vaccine or live attenuated, but of course, the recombinant zoster vaccine is uh, more efficacious. Next slide. So in summary, in adults aged 18 to 49 years who are immunodeficient or immune suppressed due to disease or therapy, and I forgot to mention that JAK inhibitors are the most immunosuppressive medications along with steroids, the safety profile was consistent with that observed in adults aged over 50 years, the incidence of pain at the ejection site, and also systemic symptoms uh, was higher in immune compromised adults aged 18 to 49 years compared to those aged over 50. Next slide. 
So what do we need in the future? What are the gaps? We need phase three trials in subjects with uh, solid organ transplants and malignancies to be completed to determine efficacy rather than just immunogenicity. These trials have only been carried out for uh, 12 to 21 months, so we need to know the duration of efficacy in immune compromised people. We need real life effectiveness studies to increase our confidence in the trials, and we need um, trials in uh, those patients receive, receiving immunosuppressive agents or so called DMARDs, as Nikki mentioned, and there are three of those ongoing at present uh, in the USA, Sweden, and in Hong Kong. So we can look forward to results there fairly soon. Next slide. So what are the recommendations around the world? In the USA, marked in blue, and other blue nations in Europe, uh, uh, only Shingrix is now available. Zostavax has been dropped. In Canada, in orange, and Australia in orange, um, we recommend preference of recombinant zoster vaccine over the live attenuated vaccine. And our uh, uh, age distribution is similar to that of the USA. Adults over 50 are immunocompetent, and in Australia, immune compromised 18 to 50. Next slide. We can talk about these, I think, in general later on, but this just simply repeats a lot of what we've just said, that um, although Zostavax remains available and an effective vaccine in those aged over the age of 50, Shingrix is preferred, even though it's not on the free list. In immune compromised adults aged 18 to 49, Shingrix is the only vaccine available. Next slide. And uh, it is really important that uh, doctors be aware of the risk of giving a live attenuated vaccine to people who are uh, severely or moderately immune compromised. Uh, people need to be screened beforehand. We've had deaths in this country due to that. Shingrix is associated with moderately high rates of local and systemic adverse events as we've seen with the COVID RNA vaccines. It is necessary to complete the two-dose schedule of uh, the recombinant Zoster vaccine or Shingrix. Boosters are not recommended as yet for any of the vaccines, probably will never be recommended for Zoster vax. And because we're still finding out how long uh, Shingrix lasts, there's no booster dose recommendation for them as well. Thanks very much, Bill. Thank you very much, Tony. Thanks, Nikki. Thanks, Sanjay. And look, we've got plenty of time for questions, and um, I'd encourage you to put them on the chat. Um, so we'll have some questions that um, I've received already. Um, one of them is, what's the risk of Zostavax in HIV patients who are on antiretrovirals, have good CD4 counts, and who un have an undetectable viral load? Who'd like to talk? to that? <laughs> Nikki. Can't hear you, Nikki. The, the, the contraindication to, to Zostavax is really those patients um, with, with low CD4 counts. So within the ATAGI guidance, um, it is suggested that if people haven't uh, have controlled HIV and CD4 counts, uh, which are, are above 200, then you could consider using the vaccine. Okay. And, and they would be uh, presumably over 50, uh, Nikki, uh, for Zoster vaccine. Yes, that, that would be age appropriate, correct. Yes, yeah. If they're under 50, then one could argue to use Shingrix because uh, they are uh, ostensibly immune compromised. Okay, so we've got some other questions. Um, uh, you mentioned about improved pain following breakthrough zoster, so post-vaccination having breakthrough. Um, why, why do we think the pain's improved in that setting? Uh, with um, 
uh, you're talking about Zostavax in particular. Mm, yeah. yeah, this is something I've debated with Myron Levin for some time. It, it's a very interesting phenomenon. It's not seen with Shingrix uh, so much. But we, we did actually publish that there is some improvement in pain with breakthrough Zoster with Shingrix, but it's much more a mark with Zostavax. And uh, what we think is uh, happening here is that there is a different pathogenesis between uh, post-sympathetic neuralgia and protection against Zoster itself. So, in fact, you, you, you do get um, better uh, protection against post diabetic neuralgia in people over the age of 70, which is up around 65%, uh, at least in the first year. And, uh, and basically, uh, uh, that's much better than 38% against Zoster. So almost certainly this has got to, to do with uh, differences in immunopathogenesis and the effect the vaccine has on uh, T-cell responses to right. So I have another couple of questions. Um, related to that, I guess the question is, what's the place of vaccine post-exposure? Uh, so I guess that means post-exposure to um, a, a risk event in terms of um, immune-compromised individuals. Would somebody like to talk to that? Yeah, uh, I, I'm having trouble conceiving <laughs> of what... Uh, the questioner means if it's really someone who's been exposed to uh, varicella, they have to remember that about 99.5% uh, of us have had uh, <coughs> varicella by the time we're 50. Yes. And there's no real um, correlation between exposure to varicella and the induction of zoster, although some have claimed it. So I'm not quite sure what is in the questioner's mind there. Um, Another question that's come, um, can, can you give the Shingrix after Zostavax has been given in the past or after an episode of herpes zoster? Who'd like to speak to that? Yes, uh, the trials were done at five years, but Canada, the USA, Australia have all recommended that you can give uh, Shingrix safely uh, uh, about a year after, not about, a year after uh, uh, either an episode of Zoster or Zostavax. This is really important in Australia where we've got, as uh, Sanjay mentioned, perhaps 60% uptake. We're going to have a whole lot of people who've had Zostavax and, uh, and many of them now want to have Shingrix. And uh, one of my colleagues <laughs> who I enrolled in one of the Zostavax trials just told me that uh, eight years after Zostavax, he just got mild shingles the other day. So, so, so I guess partly related to that, one of the questions online is um, if someone is over 70, they've not had Zostavax, if they get shingles and they recover, do you then offer them a vaccine uh, or, or do you not offer them a vaccine? A year later. A year later. And, and would you offer them a vaccine? Yes. Um, I, I guess the other question that's come up has been um, the use of uh, the reason why, Bill, I should right. mention this yeah. is recurrent zoster occurs in right. about five percent of people. Interestingly, with jack inhibitors, you get a higher incidence of recurrent zoster. Right, which I only realised the other day. Right. Yeah. Why do you think that is? Uh, jack inhibitors are the, the most in uh, uh, the the type of DMARD which predispose most to herpes zoster. It almost gets up to levels of transplant patients. Right. Uh, really extraordinary, specific uh, defect. And that's prolonged? Yes. Yeah. It's prolonged and it can result in, uh, in recurrent zoster. Yeah. Okay. Uh, another practical question about vaccinating with Shingrix and the flu vaccine uh, and the COVID vaccine at the same time. Would somebody like to take that? Sanjay, would you like to take that? Uh, yes, yes. Uh, so the Atagi statement says that you can give COVID vaccines and and uh, shares, uh, Shingrix uh, at the same time. Uh, but uh, if if they are adjuvanted vaccines with the flu vaccine as well, though, so the what the Atagi statement says is that they can be given concomitantly. But but it's uh, if you can to separate the vaccines by a few days. 
Yeah, I think the adjuvanted um, uh, flu vaccine is the one you can't give at the same time, I think, at this stage, because we don't have data on that. But any, but certainly the ordinary flu vaccines or pneumococcal vaccines uh, can be given. Okay. Um, so another question online, um, I guess related partly to that, who, who should not get Shingrix? Who, are there any groups who should not get Shingrix? Allergy to any one of the components of Shingrix, you can look those up on the CDC websites where they talk about excipients. So if someone's had uh, a, um, an anaphylactic or severe allergic reaction in the past and the excipients in the vaccine overlap with those of Shingrix, definitely uh, uh, one should be uh, uh, very cautious uh, in uh, in thinking about giving that person uh, Shingrix. And I guess related to that, one of the questions that's come up about if somebody's got shingles, um, should they get Shingrix at that time? I, mean, I guess it's a therapeutic Nikki? vaccination. <laughs> no. Sorry. Sorry, the question? The question has come up about um, if somebody has shingles, um, should you be giving them Shingrix? No, not acutely. They, they should have convalesced from their their acute episode. Yeah, so it's a one preventive vaccine, like not, a, ther a, not yeah. a therapeutic one. Okay. Um, another question, uh, the optimal interval for the second Shingrix vaccination. So the question is, there's a recommended uh, gap, but is there an optimal time that um, that second dose should be given at? Who'd like to take that? Um, uh, the, uh, this, uh, I have particular knowledge of this, so I thought I might, might uh, pass it on. Um, two to six months is, is fine. Can be, uh, and obviously you want to get it over as soon as possible, so two months would be best. I had mine 15 months apart, driven by COVID, unfortunately. <laughs> but uh, the in the USA, they had real problems with uh, rollout. So they extended the period to 12 months, and there is actually data on that. But uh, it's not preferred two to six months, but if you can't do it, like me, mm -hmm. then basically probably 12 months. I hope I am okay. At and getting good protection. At that yeah, level. good protection. Okay. Yeah. Good immunogenicity. Right. Protection's not known. Right. Um, we, we are coming back to, and maybe we'll ask the similar question in a different way. There's a lot of questions about um, Shingrix after shingles again. Um, and, and put in different ways. This this other one is, is it necessary to vaccinate patients who've had shingles? Uh, I guess that's in people who are at risk and is in that setting is Shingrix indicated? Who'd I, like to take that? I think if someone's 90, you might think otherwise, mm -hmm. uh, you know, that shingles might last them out. They may not get recurrent zoster. Uh, the youngest I've seen zoster is seven. Mm -hmm. And it has been documented at three. So if you've got a, you know, 25, 30 year old with uh, zoster or, or uh, and uh, they're immune compromised, then uh, you certainly should be thinking about uh, um, giving them Shingrix afterwards. If they're in their 50s, uh, I'd still strongly consider giving them Shingrix. They've yeah. got many years of life to go, yep. and you don't want to get uh, recurrent zoster. Mm. Okay. A um, couple of other questions coming in. Um, uh, I don't think I've seen multidermatomal zoster. Will this be in contiguous ipsilateral dermatomes uh, or not? Um, Nikki. Nikki. Yeah, so disseminated zoster. In fact, it can be a bit of a mimic of chickenpox. Mm. You know, these patients sometimes have widespread um, vesicular lesions, you know, patchy across dermatomes. So it can actually look very similar to chickenpox. Um, but, you know, often the clincher is that the individual will have a clear history of having had chickenpox in the, in the past. Um, so this is really, um, you know, this is, this is what, yeah. Mm. It has a very um, adverse outcome as well if it's disseminated zoster. Yeah. Mm. Uh, it has a very nasty, doesn't it? It has a significant mortality. Yeah. Yeah. So, so the other clues might be, you know, looking at the liver function profile, you might see a transaminitis in these patients as well. So it's indicative of this sort of being, um, mm. you know, involving the viscera. Yeah. The, um, uh, in, in the era of AIDS, we used to see um, zoster uh, 
sometimes, yeah. you know, up here and down there, uh, which was almost pathognomonic of yeah. HIV. The other thing we should really get across, Bill, and you'd appreciate this, is recurrent zoster in the sacral region. Think herpes simplex, mm. think genital herpes. I've had a lot of referrals, I'm sure Nikki's seen this too, for recurrent zoster, yeah. it's turned out to be herpes. It's yeah. turned out to be herpes yeah. simplex. Um, other questions, um, a patient who's less than 50 years of age has recurrent shingles, would you offer them Shingrix? Um, if they're okay. non-immune compromised, you, you can't under the rules. Okay. Do you think they should have it? Do we think it would be a good idea? Uh, I think um, I'd be uh, certainly looking at, the, if they've had recurrent uh, zoster and they're under 50, uh, I'd be, uh, uh, and depending on the time interval, uh, I might be tempted to look very carefully at that particular person, mm. investigate for underlying disease. Uh, yep. And if not, um, certainly that's, uh, I mean, one of the syndromes that uh, really we've only become aware of recently is recurrent ophthalmic zoster. Yep. I had a patient referred to me uh, from Melbourne and Maria Nagel in Denver has been collecting these and they're, they're real. And exactly how to handle them is really difficult. You might, in essence, have to use prolonged uh, prophylactic antivirals as you do for... Uh, and do you agree with a sort of simple recommendation that if you're younger and have two episodes, you should be investigated, not after the first one? Um, I, I think it depend on the uh, time apart. Okay. You know, I think if uh, someone had an episode at 7 or 10 yep. and another episode at, uh, say, 45, I wouldn't be so concerned. But okay. if they're close to, close by, yeah, I think I'd be uh, having a look at what might be underlying. And would you yeah. then be giving them Shingrick at some time after that? Uh, it's not that really happen? been proven in that yeah. setting. Uh, okay. I think I'd be uh, still a bit wary. Okay, thanks. Uh, another question um, about giving vaccination to people with post hepatic neuralgia. Is that of use? Uh, any response? No. No. Tony shaking his head. Nikki shaking her head. Yeah. yeah. Um, no, there's no evidence. We don't know. The pathogenesis of post hepatic neuralgia remains very obscure. Uh, Don Gilden thought it was due to prolonged. Uh, um, uh, herpes, uh, sorry, varicella zoster virus persistence, but mm. uh, uh, that's his, probably his group was the only one who actually agreed with that. So uh, the uh, we really need to know a lot more about what results in uh, the really odd syndrome of post hepatic neuralgia. Did with allodynia, we get uh, um, uh, sensations such mm. as cold wind being perceived as pain. So you're obviously getting mixing up of your fibres in the spinal cord. That's that's actually well known. Do you think antivirals make a difference to that? Uh, no, I don't. <laughs> uh, <laughs> so a a lot of people do. <laughs> a long-standing discussion. Yeah, some people do, but I don't um, think so. Uh, and uh, uh, we've got a couple of minutes. Um, some more questions. Why does the Shingrix vaccine give better immunity than actual infection? Yeah, that's one of the things that really fascinated us. Uh, it's the adjuvant uh, that's really doing it. And this is really, um, I think, uh, an indication of, of the future. Novavax, the COVID vaccine, uses a similar type of adjuvant for this reason. So we can exceed uh, the immunity of, uh, of natural infection. That was the big lesson to me that... Mm. Uh, you take a single protein and an adjuvant combination, you can do better than a 14 times concentrated chickenpox vaccine. Extraordinary. Mm. Um, uh, another question has come through. Um, the optimal timing of vaccination with respect to transplantation. Um, would we like to answer that? Nikki? Yeah, thanks. So I think there's um, obviously the, the trials that Tony's discussed were done in autologous stem cell transplants and uh, Tony has explained that, that that dosing was at day 50 to 70 post, um, post transplanting autologous transplants. Mm -hmm. um, 
for the patients who are allogeneic stem cell transplants, uh, well, one, you wouldn't give it before transplant because often they lose their immune memory. Yep. Because of yep. And then you want them to re reconstitute as, as much of their CMI as possible. And generally, the advice would be around six to 12 months mm -hmm. for that. Most of the international guidelines are actually recommending for allogeneic transplants, you consider to be around, you know, anything from six to 12 months. Yeah. Um, for solid organ transplants, uh, again, a, a lot of the, uh, the the guidelines of various transplant society, the transplant societies have suggested that, um, you know, optimally you probably want to give the vaccine before the transplant procedure at a time when they've probably got more robust CMI, cell-mediated immunity, uh, and but where you can't do that or you've missed the boat, then usually it would be, you know, three to six months. And I don't know if Tony wants to add to no, that. No, I, I completely agree. I think that's the way the trials were run. And as I said before, with chemotherapy, they were the worst results of all uh, in cancer patients. So avoid giving uh, Shingrix during chemotherapy. I think that's uh, try and uh, it, you, you're absolutely right. You You need to... There's a risk in giving it before, even in those patients, in that you'll probably get some drop in cell-mediated immunity. But, you know, you want to protect the patient from getting exhausted during that period. So um, I think this is where we're going to find out more from the uh, phase three trials that are coming up in the future. Yeah. There's still a lot we don't know about how to use Shingrix, particularly in the immune-compromised people, I think. Look, that's, that's brought us to the end. It's a little bit after eight, and I think it's an important message to end on that um, basic as well as clinical research is enormously important in this area, and we need more of it, and um, it, it benefits our patients. Um, I'd really like to thank uh, Sanjay Jaya Singh, Nikki Gilroy, and Tony Cunningham for their expertise. I'd really like to thank you for attending and for your questions. Um, I think they've been very perceptive and they've um, extended us, and that's important. So thank you very much for the evening. Thanks to the MJA and um, GSK for sponsorship.